I believe in Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, the prelude to Adam, the author of Eden, by all, in all, through all, Genesis reason, the husband of a newborn bride. I believe earth is his love's ultimate beacon. I believe in Jesus, the infant king, ruler of the heavens, the universe's spring, yet he took the frailest of forms, the weakest of things, for our mighty God was not too proud for the stable and trough of Bethlehem's sting. I believe in Jesus, the forgiver of men. Since man could not come to God, God came to them. Though we spit in his face through our arrogance and sin, holiness became flesh and said it was forgiven. I believe in Jesus, the perfection of the law, for creation was doomed by the requirements it scrawled. But he came not to abolish correction, but fulfill us where we fall and wrote a new law on our hearts love God and love all I believe in Jesus the Lord without a throne he dumbfounded the masses by not making the crown his own lost scores of followers by letting weakness be shown and traded the palace for not having a home I believe in Jesus the tenant of the poor he saw a beloved sister where the world saw horror he ate with those who weren't allowed through the temple's doors and taught us to live with less so those with none could have some more I believe in Jesus, the horribly betrayed, unknown by the world he himself had made, handed over to death by a follower to whom silver was paid, disowned by a friend three times in one day. I believe in Jesus, the ever-turning cheek, no sword in his hand, he took the way of the weak, redefined strength as beaten and meek. When men struck him on his back, only forgiveness did he he speak. I believe in Jesus, the servant on the cross. To save the lives of the sinful, he considered his own life lost. Endured the torture of men, whips and nails in his flesh were embossed. Received the wrath of God, Father punishing Son, the ultimate cost. I believe in Jesus and that flesh in the tomb. He bore the end of a normal human as he was born of a human's womb. He died a criminal's death and was buried in another man's room God the son lay dead the lifeless groom but I still believe in Jesus and the body of his resurrection for he redefined life in death's final rejection showed holes in hands to over 500 of his own selection so that humanity would not be able to raise an objection that Jesus Christ is God the son and has made the ultimate connection so I believe in Jesus and the responsibility of his ascension. He ascended to God's right hand forever in intercession, leaving his truth in the hands of a few, the first to be called his Christians. His hands and feet are now the church, his timeless narrative expression. This is our heritage. They are our relatives. And this is our confession. We believe in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. No matter the tears of the world's hate and aggression, no matter the wares of holiness's painful progression, no matter the shares of suffering in our possession, no matter the layers of our apathy and transgression, we will carry the weight of faith's succession, for the world and its cares are nothing compared to this glorious injection, this everlasting song, this endless profession, that we are Christ's Christians and we live our radiant confession. I I believe in Jesus Christ, the rallying cry of our eternal obsession. Hey, welcome back, Family of Christ. Cross training to our next online edition of Cross Training. We are on uh, Unit 2, Lesson 7 today. We're going to be focusing on the second article of the Creed, um, which speaks again about Jesus, our Savior. We're going to focus a little bit more about what it means that Jesus is our Lord. So our joy and our salvation is in the Lord. So um, our lesson focus here, as you can see, as Christians, we confess that our salvation and our all our joy rests on Jesus, our Lord. 
he sets us free to live under his care and to serve in him and others. So when we think about lordship, it reminds us, if you will, like a king or under somebody's kingdom that we are part of and our Lord and be our leader. So Jesus is our Lord. Now, it's a different kind of Lord. I used to play a game when I was younger, uh, growing up. I, it might be even outlawed today. I don't know. But during the winter, we get these big piles of snow at school, you know, and, and we would play this game called King of the Hill. And you would try to climb to the top of the hill and push other people down until you were the last one standing. Um, that's not the kind of king we're talking about when we think about Jesus as our Lord. He is a, a, a Lord who cares and serves and loves. So we're going to dig into what it means that he's our Lord today. So make sure you're ready. Uh, print off the hand up, hand up below on the resources tab. Have it ready to go. Fill in the key points as we go. So again, here we've been going through the Apostles' Creed the past several weeks. We're still on the second article of the Creed, the third and final part of the second article of the Creed. Again, the first article of the Creed speaks to God the, uh, God the Father, Creator, Preserver. And the uh, second article talks about Jesus, um, the Savior, Redeemer, and today how He's our Lord. And then next week we're going to introduce the third ar article of the Creed speaking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. All right, well, let's dig in. Question number one asks, what is the second article of the Creed? And so here we see it. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? So part three, this is what we're going to focus on today, that I may be His own and live under Him in His kingdom. Here we go and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. All right. Key point number two asks this question, for what purpose has Christ freed me from sin, death, and the devil? So it's getting at the question, why, why did Jesus do all this? Why did God sacrifice for us in the first place? Second Corinthians says this, uh, 5 verse 15, he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised again. So why did Jesus do this for us? He did this so that we may, he, that he may be our Lord, so that, we, uh, that I might live with him and for him in peace and joy and now and forever. And that means you too. So um, yeah, he did this so that he would be our Lord, that we would be his kingdom. And because of that, we will live with him forever in eternity. Uh, question number three, what does it mean to confess that I belong to Christ? Uh, so when we say we're Christians, that we are Christ followers, um, what does that mean? And it, let's look at these passages. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by, the faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we no longer live for ourselves, for our selfish desires, but for God's purposes and plans. 1 Peter 2, but you are a chosen race, a, whole, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people uh, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So God dearly loves us. He values us, he even calls us his royal priesthood, which means that we can love and serve others and proclaim his good news. So what does it mean to confess that we belong to Jesus? It means that we're united with him by faith, so that he is mine and I am his. We belong together. All right. So in the past few weeks, we've been introducing this diagram of the um, how sin separates us from God, kind of like this cavern, if you will. Um, sin, which was introduced way back with Adam and Eve, and we've sinned ever since, has caused a, a brokenness between us and God. And so... Um, if we remember last week, we talked about how Jesus redeemed us, or he bought us back. If the wages of sin is death, the penalty for sin is death, somebody had to pay that penalty. It was either us or God. And Jesus did that on our account. He paid the penalty. We're going to have physical death in this world. We're not going to live forever. But our soul and our spirit will go on living eternally with God. And eventually, our, even our physical body will be re reunited with us. But we'll be with God eternally because of what Jesus did for us. He paid that penalty. Um, so question number four, what does it mean that I live under our Lord Jesus in his kingdom? So now if we belong in this kingdom, is, is Jesus is our Lord, what does it look like? What does it mean? 
Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All right. So this isn't like a labor camp, but it's a place that we can find rest and be rejuvenated. We certainly want to love and serve God and serve others, but He comes to we, this place, this kingdom that we have, is a place for restoration. John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Even God even removes fear in this kingdom. Colossians 1 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So kingdom of darkness is talking about hell and uh, damnation, but through Christ we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. And then John 14 says, But the Helper, this is speaking about the Holy Spirit, um, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to re- uh, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So if I were to pull that all together, what does it mean to live under Jesus and his kingdom? A, he graciously, um, uh, he graciously rules and defends me, protects me, and gives me rest. So that's the kind of kingdom we live in, where there, there's a defender of us, somebody who protects us and gives us safe haven to be able to rest B, he sends the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, to be with me, to teach me, and to sanctify me. So we live in a kingdom where God is building us, strengthening us, to help us to become more and more like Jesus in our everyday life, that we can love and serve others like Jesus did. All right, question number five. What does it mean that Jesus is called the Christ? So, you know, we we understand, in fact, we know several names that have been given to Jesus, and one of them is Christ. So what does Christ mean? It simply means this. Christ means anointed one. Anointing was a way that somebody was selected or determined for a special purpose. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our prophet, priest, and king. So we're going to look at these three different words. What does it mean that Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king? And it describes his relationship with us now. So uh, to be our prophet, what does that mean? Uh, It simply means as our prophet, Jesus proclaims the word of God to us. So just like the prophets in the Old Testament, how they shared, um, you know, messages from God to people, you know, sometimes it was a warning, sometimes it was a call to repentance, a call to trust and lean on God. Jesus is also our prophet today that he draws us through his word. He he brings us into a relationship with him through the word of God. Um, Number seven, what does it mean that Jesus is our priest? So a priest is a term they used to use in the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, but it means this, as our priest Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for our sin, and he intercedes with the Father on our behalf. So in the Old Testament, the priests were responsible for providing sacrifices for the people to atone for their sin or make up for their sin. Remember in the New Testament, who made up for our sin? Who sacrificed for our sin? It was Jesus. So in a sense, Jesus was the perfect priest giving the one-time, all-time sacrifice for all people and for all sin who trust and believe in him. So he's like our priest who sacrifices for us. And then eight, what does it mean that Jesus is our king? So again, I talked about the king of the hill. That's not the kind of king that Jesus is. Ephesians 1.20 says that God raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him on the right hand. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the, of the church, which is, body, uh, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So when we talk about Jesus being our king, it mean, reminds us that he rules over all creation, and especially for the good of his church. So God is always working towards a good purpose, and he uses his beloved church to accomplish his will and plans in this world. All right, which you're part of. So for our So What, Know What, Now What, I want you to watch this video. It's by a man named David Nasser who grew up in a Muslim country, came to the United States, held on to their family, loosely hung on to their Muslim faith, but how the power of Jesus transformed not only David Nasser's life, but many, many, many people after him. And uh, I want you to just watch this video just as a reminder of how Jesus can make a difference in our lives by being our Lord, and as we are part of his kingdom. So check this out. We'll see you back. I actually grew up not too far from here. I grew up in Iran. And in 1979, I saw religion destroy my country. Religion gone wrong cost the lives of over a million people in Iran. 
My dad was a religious man, but not too devout. But he was also a military man. And so when the Iranian Revolution happened, we escaped religion. We had to get out of Iran because the government was overthrown by Ayatollah Khomeini and his zealots. And so when we escaped and we came to America as refugees, basically, we came, and in my mind as a little boy, we were escaping religion and God's representation. And so for years and years in America, I wanted to have nothing to do with anything that had a cross, a crescent, or a star, or anything on it. Well, one day, a buddy of mine invited me to go to church with him. Now, he wasn't really a devout Christian. He was just hanging out with me, and he invited me to church. And this was after high school. And I told him, I said, look, I, I don't want to go to church. I hate religion. I told him all the reasons. I told him how it had destroyed my country. But my buddy said, no, 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 no. This is a Muslim stuff, man. This is Christian stuff. And I'd seen Christianity on TV, honestly. I'd seen people with big hair sitting in a golden chair, you know, saying, Jesus loves you, show me the money or whatever. And so I told him all the reasons I didn't want to go to church. And instead of giving up, he ends up giving me the name of five of the hottest girls from our school. And he says, look, they all go to my church. And so I felt motivated to go visit. And I've got to admit, I went for the wrong reason the first time I ever went. But when I went there, I saw not religion, but grace. I saw real people, not religious people, not people who acted really cleaned up, but just forgiven people who were dealing with everyday life stuff, but there was something different about them. The grace of God had made them gracious, had made them graceful. And every Monday, these people would come and visit me. They had this thing called visitation. And I'm telling you, every time they came over, all they talked about was Jesus Christ. They didn't talk about all the things I was doing wrong. Instead, they kept telling me about all the things that Jesus had done right. And Jesus, to me, was a religious figure. And so I kept telling them, I don't want to have anything to do with religion. And they would say, we don't either. This isn't about religion. This is about Jesus. Well, one night, I went to their church. They dragged me there. And when I was there, I heard this preacher preach. We're talking about an old school Southern Baptist preacher, guy with a comb over. And he's like, come on down. We'll condemn you and the kids. You're going to fry in the head like a piece of sausage, you know? And, and he was passionate. But when you're lost, you don't see it as passion. You see it as anger. I remember thinking, man, if the gospel is such good news, why is this guy so mad? But I didn't realize he just believed enough in what he knew to be the truth that he wanted me to hear it. And that night, I felt convicted because he was telling me the truth. But when you're lost, you don't see it as conviction. You really see it as a guilt trip. So during the invitation, while other people were going forward, I hit the aisle and I went the other way to get away from church. Well, I went home and I realized something, that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's not just contained in little church buildings. And when I got there, God continued to convict me. I eventually opened up a Bible in my room really late at night. I was home all by myself that night and started to read. And I read a story about a man named Peter who on a stormy night was called out by Jesus to step out of a boat. That Bible all of a sudden jumped out at me. In an instant, God said, David, I want you to step out and I want you to trust me. Just as Jesus was saying to Peter, come, he was saying to me, come. I just hit one knee and I said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you're the only hope that I have for cleansing. I know you're the only hope I have for salvation. I offer all of myself to you. I submit my life to you. And everything changed that night. That night, the old me died and a whole new me was born again. But I realized that moment was this, that Christianity is not about bad people becoming good. That's religion. Christianity is about dead people becoming alive in Christ. The night that I became a Christian, my parents hit the roof. When they found out that I'd given my life to Jesus, my dad became very devout as a Muslim instantly. He was like, you can't be a Christian, but Muslims. And I was like, we are? We've never been really that devout. But then he thought, you know what? It's just a stage in David's life. He's got a tennis racket because he wanted to be Andre Agassi. He's got a guitar and all the guitar lessons never panned out. He's done all these different things. He's got a surfboard, even though we live four hours away from any body of water. Let him just have a Bible and he'll get over religion. But they didn't realize that when you give your life to Jesus, when you really do that, it's not like a cold, a Christian cold that you catch and it goes away. It's a whole new you. And the night that I went to get baptized at my church, I got kicked out of the house for my faith. But within five years, the same parents that kicked me out of the house, one by one, my entire family, not just my mom, not just my dad, but my sister and my brother, had come to know Christ as their Savior. All right. Hey, well, again, I hope that you see this as an opportunity. When, you know, when we follow Jesus and when we are His disciples and we share 
the good news with other people. We never know the trajectory that might change in this world. Uh, we might make a difference in one person's life, but that person might make a difference in a couple people's lives, and it can go on and on and grow. <clears throat> That's why God uses us. He uses us as part of his team, and it's cool to be part of that. All right, some quotes from um, Jesus himself. He says, and know that I am with you always, yes, to the very end of time. And that's a promise we can trust in when Jesus says that we have eternal life with him. We know that we can trust in him and that that promise will come through. Um, this is from a man named Nick Boyacek. He's a speaker and uh, he's an inspirational speaker, but he has a powerful, powerful message about Jesus. He says this, the joy of the Lord is my strength, knowing that he is with me, knowing that he will never leave me knowing that he is bigger than any circumstances and that he loves us. So if you notice here, Nick does not have um, neither arms or legs, and yet he has not let that conquer or dissuade or discourage him from serving God. Um, Nick has been used by God to bring many, many people to the knowledge of the gospel, and the Holy Spirit is working through him. So no matter what our challenges are, we can serve God too, and he's got a place for us for that. Uh, this is from Francis of, of Assisi. He says, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. And may we look for those dark corners of this world, and the, whether it's in our school or our neighborhood, that we can bring the light of the gospel, bring the light of God's love um, to all people. This one's from Martin Luther. I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. And so we can trust in God's promises. He'll never let us down. He is always with us. Our Bible verse for today comes from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. This is a great verse to put in your memory. It's a little bit longer, but it's powerful. Great one to remember. I have been crucified with Christ, meaning that my sins were paid for on the cross. It was no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, great passage. Um, make sure you get together now um, with uh, some family members, gather up with uh, whoever's around, and make sure at least one parent, go through the discussion page on the back side of the key points and have some good discussion about today's session. Once you're done with that, you can have a parent sign off on your memory work and the lesson, and you can turn it in later for credit. But thank you again for joining us for today's lesson, and uh, um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week as we introduce... Uh, the third article of the creed, and um, the uh, Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. All right, God bless. See you all later. Bye now.